Hi there folks, this is another Iceland update on the developing situation there. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. Appreciate all that have been watching my updates. Uh, for the most part, it seems to be helping some folks get some of the science without the hyperbole, without so much of the alarmism that is so prevalent on the internet. So I hope that finds you in a good spot and that you're doing well. Um, just real quick summary on some of the things that have been happening during the day since my last update this morning. It is right now about five o'clock Mountain Standard Time, which means it's about midnight in Iceland. Uh, right now there is not an eruption happening uh, but we really feel like it's imminent. We really feel like the eruption could happen at any time, possibly within the... So we're looking at a timetable more like hours to a few days, as opposed to several days ago, we were looking at maybe weeks or so or days. And so the, the timetable is definitely front and center, right in front of us. Uh, the good news is, is that Iceland has done a great job of evacuating the people in Gudindavik. Um, and moving those people out of harm's way. So they've done pretty much all they can uh, for the most part. And now it's a wait and see period, waiting to see exactly where the volcano uh, erupts, where the vent opens up. I think we're past the worst of it as we look at the earthquake. So let's maybe start uh, with some of the data I have here. Um, let's start, first of all, just our, our webcam view, looking into uh, Gudindavik. Um, downtown area there um, and the boat or two out in the harbor I believe that's the Coast Guard and let's start with the Icelandic Met Office so this is their uh, agency government scientific agency kind of like the USGS in the in the United States that's tasked with monitoring uh, hazards and earthquakes and weather and then updating uh, the public and also informing public officials um, and so if we look at this a little bit, uh, the most recent update today, again, November 11th, is a significant likelihood of a volcanic eruption. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to the map here in a second. I'll pull it up on Google Earth. But there, based on the earthquake data, their models suggest that the intrusion of magma, the actual conduit that the magma has moved up into the crust is about 15 kilometers long, so about 9 to 10 miles in length. Uh, that makes it quite a bit bigger in terms of length and size than some of the other volcanic eruptions we've seen over the last three years in Iceland. Some of the highlights in this update, um, let's see, so they had some people met. They've got all their top people together, crunching the numbers, looking at the data, and it estimated the intrusion is propagating upward slowly, so it's moving towards the surface but it's thought to be about 800 meters below the surface. Uh, so that's pretty notable. So it is really close to the surface. Remember this intrusion of magma several days ago was down four or five kilometers, you know, about two, three miles down. And now it's much, much closer to the surface. It's taken the last couple days to break the rocks and make room for the, more, the magma that has been injected from a deeper source up towards the surface. So as that magma has worked its way up towards the surface, um, it's found conduits and pathways, weak zones in the rock that it's exploiting. And now we're looking at a magma body that's a good uh, 10 or so miles in length, um, about 12, 15 kilometers. I guess that's a little less than 10 kilometers. Um, you can do the conversion, um, but it's about 800 meters below the surface. The exact location of a possible eruption, whoops, sorry about that, uh, is unknown. So they don't know, no, it's anyone's guess as to where um, this thing is going to erupt exactly. Um, and I'll get to that here in a second. Uh, but the length and orientation of the dike gives a good indication of possible sources. Um, and their assessment is the, the it's possible on, on just a few days. So hours to days is sort of the time frame that we're looking at now. Um, and then also the likelihood of a submarine eruption has increased. I wouldn't say that's the most likely scenario, and I think they would agree with that. Um, but they just are saying, hey, let's 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 have that on the table as a possibility. Uh, so this is their map here. Um, and I want to show you, I basically redrew the same sort of thing on um, Google Earth. And so there's that orange line is more or less in line with the intrusive body of magma that's now beneath Iceland. And so it extends uh, from the northeast here. You can see this chain of craters here. This is the Sunnukur 
craters that erupted about two, three thousand years ago. These are the craters that fed lava flows that poured down towards the coastline and actually formed the very land that Glindavik sits on. Um, and that chain of craters ends about here, um, but there, the seismic data and the uplift data from GPS instruments um, extends that intrusive body of magma out across the west side of the town and then into this offshore region here. So in a nutshell, any place on or very close to this orange line would be a place where we'd expect to see the eruption beginning. What we don't expect is the whole thing to like split at once. So it's likely that the magma finds its way to the surface somewhere along here. Um, and then once that conduit is open and that vent is cleared to the surface, that's going to result in a lot of that lava pouring out of that site, relieving the pressure of the magma and its gases that's underground. Uh, and then it will start to commence erupting and, and that lava pouring downhill for some time. It's very likely, as we've seen with other eruptive sites, for example, the last three eruptions over here in this part of Iceland, that we start out with a, a, what we call a fissure eruption, a line, a crack in the ground, if you will, where the lava is sort of spitting and oozing out of the ground. Um, and over time, what it'll do is it'll um, consolidate into several or maybe one specific vent. And so initially, we might see this erupting in you know maybe a line that's maybe a few kilometers long uh, multiple vents but over time a lot of times the ways the, these evolve is that they consolidate into one primary events we saw this in 2018 in hawaii we've seen it with these three eruptions here in iceland and so that's uh that's what we're looking at here still still a threat to the power plant and the blue lagoon depending on exactly where this vent opens up obviously if the vent is much further to the south the power plant and the blue lagoon are uphill of that so they would be completely spared from any sort of uh, impact with the lava but if the vent opens up further up in the the volcanic system here uh, then it's possible that the blue lagoon and, and and or the power plant are at risk um, so if we do get an eruption down here in the ocean you can see if you can see the elevations there on google earth it's pretty shallow water so out to the tip here it's maybe only about 80 or so feet deep and so that would mean that if that uh, magma made its way to the seafloor off the coast here uh, the seawater would be dramatically heated up we'd have an interaction between lava and water that's what we call a phreatomagmatic uh, eruption. These tend to be a little bit more explosive. So we'd actually have the heat from the lava, which is over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, heating up the water, flashing a lot of it to steam, moving water from liquid to steam phase is an expansion process. Um, and so that would actually cool, start to cool and quench the lava quickly, but the expansion would actually cause it to shatter and break. So it's basically uh, it's explosive um, locally. Now, not to say this isn't going to be, this is not just to set sort of, sort of some fears to rest. This is not explosive like Mount St. Helens, Yellowstone. Those are explosive because of the magma types. Here we have a magma type that's very runny. It's very fluid. It's hot um, and it tends to produce just lava. But when we get water interacting with that lava, that's when it becomes what again what I'll call locally explosive so again in this region maybe within um, you know a few kilometers of where this interaction is taking place if it were to erupt there uh, that would be a bad place to be but we certainly don't expect you know um, you know people to be impacted miles away uh, the ash is probably gonna be pretty localized depending on which way the winds blowing the ash could settle over some area. It could impact air quality a little bit, but I don't think it's gonna be anything like what we saw in 2010 when we had uh, the volcanic eruption here at uh, Ayatayoka, um, the volcano that erupted under a glacier. That was a much bigger uh, event. So maybe a better analog to what we might have here if it were to be offshore would be the eruption here in 1973 on the Isle of Heime in the Vestman Islands. Uh, and you can see some of the cones here and the, and the lava flows from that. This was a big, uh, quite historic eruption in, in, in Iceland, uh, but it was only 
explosive and impacting in this region. I'm not trying to negate the impact to the community here, but this was not an event that uh, you know shut down air traffic in Europe or was regionally uh, impactful. So uh, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Uh, so really we're at kind of the wait and see scenario stage. Uh, let me come back here to some of the other data looking at the earthquakes. Like I said, the, the worst of the earthquakes is likely over unless the uh, earthquakes start to pop up uh, again because the magma is intruding elsewhere. So let me get down to the right right area here uh, around Grindavik and we'll see what the earthquakes are looking like here. Um, mainly we've seen a big reduction in both the number of earthquakes and in the um, the size of the earthquake. So we're getting smaller earthquakes and we're getting less frequent earthquakes. And my computer's kind of frozen up there. Um, but you can see this is actually 24 hours of data. So that actually shows quite a bit. And hopefully if my computer works here, I can show you that the magnitude of the earthquakes and the overall number of those quakes has actually gone down quite a bit. Let's try to open a new tab here, see if that works. Yeah, so there's our data uh, over 24 hours. And if we can reduce that down a little bit, that looks crazy and, and obnoxious. But if we can take that down to um, just the last maybe four, six, eight hours, something like that. Again, the sites, there we go. Um, come on. Either I'm not being patient enough or there we go. So let's look at like the last four hours, let's say. Um, and you can see, you know, and these are these are all earthquakes over magnitude zero. If we just select twos and aboves, you can see uh, very few, right? So the earthquake intensity and frequency has dropped off dramatically. Uh, there are some pictures coming out of uh, Grindavik. So there are uh, some emergency officials. I'm not sure exactly uh, the source here. This was posted on the uh, Iceland seismology and volcanology page that uh, some folks follow. Um, and this shows some of the damage from the earthquakes in town. So you can see some of the the offset here and the movement from the shaking that's caused some of the ground to crack along some of the roadways. So this is all earthquake damage in and around uh, Grindavik. So, so even once, uh, you know, hopefully things, people are allowed back into their homes, there's still gonna be quite a bit of work that needs to take place in and around town just to um, work on some of the infrastructure that's been damaged by uh, the earthquakes and the, and the fault, the movement along the faults there. So you can see, I think that might be the last one. Oh, there's another one there. So uh, anyway, so yeah, again, we're in a wait and see phase right now. Um, could be tonight, could be tomorrow, but definitely within a few days. We've got the people evacuated and it's really just a, a matter of where this thing uh, erupts. I would say now though, if I had to put numbers on it, probably looking at 85, 90% chance of an eruption within the next few days. I think it's uh, very likely that it erupts somewhere in the zone that we've looked at here to, to today, um, but not sure exactly where, where, where it will be. Uh, the impact, of course, though, so the worst impact would be, well, offshore would be better in a way because then you spare the town inundation by lava and perhaps you just have ash fall in the town. Um, I think the worst case scenario would be uh, a very large volume eruption high in the volcanic system further up the hill that uh, poses a risk to both the power plant, the Blue Lagoon, and the town itself, as well as uh, possibly all these roadways we see here. So, but this is mainly going to be a lava producing eruption. Uh, and, you know, just to put a little damper on this a little bit, I suppose, all these linear arrangements you see as you kind of scan through this part of Iceland, all these north, east, southwest trending ridges and mountain ranges um, and chains of volcanoes. This is the history of Iceland. This is what makes Iceland so great is its volcanic history, um, the tectonic setting. And even if you move into other parts of the country, you see this trend that's here. And, that the, and the reason we see these trends is the tectonic and volcanic activity uh, that's taken place for 
a long time here in Iceland. And so this is just the latest chapter in that history. And unfortunately, we have uh, some lives and livelihood at risk, but we'll get through this as best we can. And hopefully uh, Iceland will be better and stronger for it. So I'll update you when something else happens here on the radar, uh, maybe tomorrow and Sunday, if there's anything uh, noteworthy to update you with. I'll be sure to do that. But thanks so much for your support. Thanks for tuning in. I uh, hope you appreciate the information and the analysis I provided and stay safe. Thanks so much.